It's the Q. Here is your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We're in Santa Clara, California, on the ground at Ixia's uh, office, a new office at the remodeling, a lot of exciting stuff going on. And we're really excited to be joined by Bethany Mayer, CEO and president of Ixia. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me here at the office. Absolutely. Really so you've been on theCUBE a ton of times. You're yes. big CUBE favorite, Love uh, the Cube. women in tech. So now you've got a new adventure. So tell us a little bit about Ixia and what's going on here. Right. So, uh, yes, I recently joined Ixia as CEO. Wonderful company, has a great heritage and really strong IP, has always been ahead of the technology trends because of what we do. And really, the focus here at Ixia is on driving um, application performance for our customers as al also security resilience for our customers. So two very key things that we provide validation for and optimization. And I know you're super technical, Dig down a little bit deeper and, and talk about some of the secret sauce or the ways that you're helping customers achieve that. Sure, so we have three big customer segments. We um, uh, sell to the network equipment manufacturers, we sell to carriers, and we sell to enterprises. And we have a very, very strong um, uh, presence in the, in the network equipment providers. In fact, we're number one in that space in what we do, which is primarily testing their devices and validating the devices that they build. So whether it's you know, one gig, 10 gig, 25 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, all of those things have to be tested and our products provide that. With the carriers, we have, we have virtualized our products so that we can help them when they virtualize their networks. We're there to validate those networks and test those virtual network functions um, so they perform as well. And we also provide uh, security resilience in that we can test for um, architectures that could possibly be breached by unknown attacks. And then finally in the enterprise, we can also validate the design of their networks, so test that, and we can monitor and uh, secure the performance of their network. So we offer a lot. A lot, so you uh, self-prescribed woman of the valley, beyond just being a woman in tech, we were talking a little bit off camera, so you've been at this tech thing a long time. A long I wonder time. if you can give some perspective on on really some of these, these, these trends that are really taking hold and kind of a a critical mass of Moore's law all over the place right. in open source right. and virtualization. And as virtualization has moved from compute to store yes. to network, right. and give kind of your perspective on how this is changing the world and how it's still in a really crazy and exciting place to be. It is really exciting. Actually, I gave a, a talk yesterday on disruption and what's going on. And there are lots of disruptors. Open source and, the, and what it creates in terms of changes in business model is a huge disruptor because people are not only utilizing it to build products internally, they're building businesses on it. So they're curating open source and they're using it to build products, which is really cool. So that business model is beginning to, to morph. Also, um, virtualization is huge. I mean, everything is virtualized except the network, which finally is getting virtualized. And that's going to have a huge change and has had already a huge impact on the network uh, manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, as well as all of the customers out there who are making that change. Um, whether it's enterprise with SDN or whether it's carriers with network function virtualization, everyone wants to utilize the benefits of virtualization. Um, the other big uh, disruptor is Internet of Things. So we do a lot of device testing. So that's not just not uh, routers and switches, that's handheld devices. Right, right. And that's also um, Ethernet in cars. And so there's a huge trend towards Internet of Things and all of that will have to be validated and tested, which is exciting for us, um, but it's also you know, really exciting for what that'll bring to the Valley in terms of new technologies. It's, it's crazy, we were at this little show, Location and, and, uh, and Context World, mm. uh, a couple weeks ago, yeah. and it was interesting, um, Zebra technology, an old RFID barcode reader, mm -hmm. is now getting new life and new applications and leveraging Internet of Things and sensors that and RFID sense. tags and, and new applications specifically that are talking about sports and right. tracking people and yeah. so it's a pretty it's pretty crazy time both with new technology as well as using old technology in new ways. Right. So let's talk about how you got into this thing. You you were a poli sci major yes. um, and then you went into Lockheed and something happened in there. How did you switch from being a poli sci major to being into a networking technology. guru? Um, so some of it is job experience I have to say. Um, so Lockheed was a really interesting place where I became a project manager 
for classified products. One of the classified products I happened to work on was the F-117A stealth fighter. And I managed the um, radar absorbing material on the windows of, of that product and others like it. Um, and that was really exciting and really turned me on to, wow, technology is cool and interesting and exciting. And I want to do more around this area. And so I left there um, through a friend, always through a friend. Someone went somewhere um, and headed to Apple, where, again, the technology was so exciting. I participated in the early phases of um, the laptop uh, industry in that we were building PowerBooks, and I was involved in the PowerBook manufacturing, and then moved at Cisco, which what my parents thought was a food company. Which um, it is. But very big. It is a big <laughs> yeah, food company. Yeah, there is a big food the company. The Cisco with an S as yeah, opposed the, to the C. The Cisco with the C <laughs> was the company that I happened to go to. And that, in, the, in at Cisco, I, I got more training. So I actually was trained, and I did um, the courses that you take for being certified in a Cisco, as a Cisco uh, network admin. I did not take all of them. I'm not a certified CCIE, let me be clear. But I did take several of them, and I began to actually help design and build product, which was very exciting for me. And then I just continued on there. I think networking is very exciting, always have. But also, the technology world is really cool, and I've learned a lot and just enjoy it tremendously. So it's been a good career. It's been a good ride. So you're a big proponent of, of, of women in tech. You've won a ton of awards. You speak a lot. Um, not only are there not a lot of women in technology traditionally, but there are probably even fewer in defense. So how did you find you know, being able to be accepted and make some traction and gain some ground in that world? You know, I think that to some degree, not, to, uh, not completely, but to some degree, technology has a meritocracy to it. So people do notice if you perform well. And so I've been fortunate that the people that I've worked for have noticed that and have helped me progress in my career. And then the other thing I would say is, um, you know, if a woman feels like they're not progressing, they need to make a decision about, you know, should I stay at this company? Should I go somewhere else to make my progression? Um, is there any concern about bias? And if so, maybe there's another place for them. So I think you have to think carefully about the environment you're in, what you're doing, how you're performing, because hard work absolutely is a key, key component of it. And, and all of those things together can combine for good decision making about your career. So what you're saying too is you really need to manage the process yourself. You have to take ownership of it. And if it's yes. not working out, then you got to go find something different. I consider myself a free agent. <laughs> so <laughs> I guide my course myself. Good. And that's how I've always done it. And it, it actually has been um, a good thing for me. And then talk a, bit, a little bit about the role of mentorship too, because mm -hmm. mentorship is very, um, very important both as specifically as having a mentor to look up to and kind of look out for you, but also in terms of, of uh, a mentorship role yes. for people to look up to. You know, I wonder if you can speak to some of your mentors, sure. uh, people that looked out for you or right. you looked up to, and or some of the things that you're doing back the other direction now that you're CEO and president. Sure. So I have had several mentors, both men and women. Um, I would say fairly early in my career, I met a really extraordinary woman, Judy Estrin who is the former CTO of Cisco and also a serial entrepreneur. And I've been very fortunate. I actually worked in one of the companies that she created. I also um, just became more a friend of hers. And she has helped tremendously in terms of my understanding of the technology industry and just giving me advice on what to do and, and what my next step might be. Um, but she's a huge inspiration, too. I mean, this is a woman who's founded, I want to say, five, maybe six companies uh, the last one she sold to Yahoo, um, tremendous technologist. So she was a great inspiration for me and a very good mentor. Um, and then uh, at HP, I had an excellent, um, I would say, mentor and sponsor, which was Dave Donatelli. So I worked for Dave Donatelli for four years at HP, and he was the individual who both put me in the role of running all of marketing for the enterprise uh, division but also put me in the role of the HP networking um, gen general manager. And that was a big jump for, right. for him. Right. And um, you know, luckily I succeeded 12 consecutive quarters of growth, which is great, but um, he had to make that decision. So I, I have much, uh, you know, he's a wonderful person that way. He makes choices around performance and accountability, and I really appreciated that. That's great. Well, Dave's another uh, great CUBE alumni, and oh we, yeah. actually, we just saw him last night at an event oh. in San Francisco. Okay. Um, 
So he's he's uh, he's, still he's still around, around and we're kind of sure waiting for him to exciting. land somewhere. Yeah, so yeah, f- so final final thing before we go. So again, uh, you're very active in, in in the women in tech and the girls in STEM. I wonder if there's any particular organizations mm-hmm. that you'd like to highlight um, for either young girls, women, family sure. uh, that they should maybe get involved with in or with or consider getting involved with yes. um, to help them out. Absolutely. So when I was at HP, we founded the Women's Innovation Council, which was a group of a lot of women CIOs, which again are a rare breed, um, but there are several out there, brilliant women. Um, and we all started to look at uh, how to help girls come up through technology. One of the groups that we have worked with is called Girls Who Code yep. um, and also Girl Geeks all great um, organizations that help girls starting in um, elementary school learn about technology and math and how exciting and important it is and to really think about a career in technology. So um, we have worked with those. I've worked with them. Wonderful organizations would highly recommend them. Awesome. So Bethany, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your busy day, getting this uh, your new position going with Ixia, exciting times. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We're live in Santa Clara on the ground at Ixia. Thanks for watching.